Okay, let us go ahead and get ourselves started. Welcome back for session four of 120C to 20C. Today we're going to continue looking at how we can uh, use automation tools to help assist us with our design work. Often when we're doing sort of complex designs which are very irregular in shape, a little bit of automation goes a long way towards automatically placing the components in the design as opposed to having to put them all in there manually and very explicitly. It's especially useful if the design may change, if there may be some parameters that you sort of pull things around or change the shape of things and you'd like uh, all the elements to adapt to that new shape fairly automatically. So we're going to explore working with adaptive families today as opposed to explicit families or kind of standard Revit component families. Um, ones that are very good about readapting and kind of changing to different shapes. And then look at how we can use some computed geometry to help place those Revit elements. So continuing with the whole notion of if we do go through and kind of start creating some uh, equations that are governing different lines, how those lines could ultimately like uh, start to drive a lot of the geometry. Okay. So just in terms of getting going today, recapping where we were, in the last couple sessions we spent a lot of time looking at how we just place and get different sorts of elements. So grabbing them, um, selecting one, selecting many, selecting things um, that are happening in the rev environment, or just placing things based on some geometry that we're computing. And then there were a couple of functions that we used along the side, setting and getting parameter values, which turned out to be going through and adjusting things as we went. Okay. Um, we looked at that through, oh, the ripples on the pond. A lot of people kind of kept on going with that. We looked at a retractor cubes and this whole notion of window instances that would follow a sine wave and stuff like that. That's actually kind of a good foundation for where we're going. What we want to do today is continue to kind of think about these families and how we make them parametric and ultimately adaptive, which is a little bit different. Okay, just as we get going though, let me kind of point out a couple logistical things that, oh, I've slowly been surely been catching up on. Oh, out on the Canvas site, if you go hanging out to the Canvas site right now, you'll actually see, okay, files are still there. That's all kind of uh, pretty much the way it was. You'll find session four files out there today. So go ahead and download if you, uh, those if you can, so you can have those available. Um, the other thing I want to show you, though, is in terms of the calendar. You can look at it in terms of either the calendar okay, or in terms of the syllabus. It sort of works either way in the Canvas system. Let me go back over to um, our authorization. If you go to, where is the syllabus? Home. There's syllabus. Right down there. You have all the different kind of class sessions listed out here. If you go clicking on one of the different class sessions, okay, we've now embedded in them uh, just the links to the video recordings, the handouts, the mind map for that day. So if you want to follow along with any of this stuff, um, either watching the YouTube, uh, YouTube recordings, kind of downloading things there, or if you like to, uh, these mind maps that I gather things with, you can go ahead and grab those. Mind mapping is kind of a, kind of a cool technology but all those are available just out there on the web. So any of those notes, and I just kind of uh, continue to take notes about these things through class, so it's kind of the best way to like, kind of capture a lot of that information. Okay. We try to make this information actually available in a number of places. So it exists out there in Canvas, which is kind of very handy for all the folks who are here on campus. If you're not on campus, so you don't have access to the Stanford network, and you want to be able to get to the same information, we also can have to put it out on Bimtopia. So let me kind of show you where that is. Just out there on Bimtopia, which is the kind of site I maintain for sharing a lot of information, all our class stuff shows up under parametric design and optimization. And you'll find in there under winter 2016, links to all the class sessions, that just goes out to the YouTube the playlist. So that's a cookie way to get to that. The other thing that we'll start putting out there, I only got the first one out there last night, but under the parametric design and optimization, just on a session one class overview, it's essentially the same thing that's on the Canvas site, just available kind of to an external kind of community. So again, it's the uh, web uh, recordings, it's the handouts that can be downloaded from Dropbox, it's uh, the mind maps. 
Yeah, I gotta put them out there so that they're available to us even when you're outside of the Stanford system. Okay, so it kind of works both ways. Okay, super. Enough with all the logistics. Let's go ahead and get ourselves back into what we actually want to be doing today. So the idea was we're gonna start with the whole notion of just parametric families, both parametric families in the kind of classic Revit component family sense and also adaptive component families, which would be really useful for us. Um, the parametric window families we started with last time, we kind of talked about putting shells with loose pins on it and things like that. Um, but we're also going to go ahead and look at things that are kind of infinitely deformable. So let's go ahead and start with that parametric window with the shelf and fins, because oh, parametric families or being able to add and kind of parametrically change families is incredibly powerful. We go on out to, there we are, Revit. And what I'm going to do is actually just open up, if you want to follow along, uh, under session four, the Dynamo examples, that just parametric window with shell. And what's going to be in here is actually it's just a series of, there's the family or the project that we were using to go through and uh, you know, illustrate how those are used. But even more important in that folder is the actual families themselves. Doing a little bit of upgrading. Which one is that? Oh, it's under, I'm opening, it's under the session four examples. It was in the 4.1 folder, oh, okay. but it's just the Revit family in there. Looks like it still has the name three point whatever. Or the, the Revit project. Doing a lot of flashing, there we go. There's my little uh, kind of sine wave of windows in there. But how this was really driven was, I'm going to open up instead just the actual family. And it'll start with like, oh, just these families. Like uh, if I go and open the one that says fixed adjustable size. Okay. We have our little uh, Revit component that can be inserted into walls. And you can't, in this view, actually see how the parametric control comes. If you go to either the floor plan view or one of the elevation views, you tend to actually start to see oh, uh, reference planes and dimensions, which actually control the shape of this. Let's see what you find in here. OK. So here, for example, is basically a series of different reference planes. Those are the green lines that are actually going to stretch object to go through and fit those green lines. And where parameters come from is each of the different dimensions which has a label on it, for example, the width is equal to two feet right now, is a parameter. That's something that we can change. So what happens is when you go through and change the different family types or put in some sort of value, all these values which are over here in the uh, family types dialog are parameters that we can change using the set parameter. We can also get them, okay, and the names are exactly what the names are here. So if you change any of the names, you know, that'll sort of follow through. That's really how it's addressed. But width is right here. You'll see width is currently set to, for this 24 inch window by 48, it's set to two feet. Let's go ahead and create a new one just so we have something a little bit different. I'm going to say I'm going to do a new one. This is going to be, oh, I'm going to say a 60 inch by 72 inch window. That's just a name. But as I go through and I put in the uh, height, that's going to be uh, 72 inches, 0, 72. As I put in the width right in here, 60. What's going to happen is as soon as I say apply, which is of course hiding around under there, you see it'll stretch. What's actually happened just in terms of understanding the hierarchy of things is the dimension has stretched. It has in turn pushed the green reference planes out. And because that is pulled out, and the window opening, which is 
hook onto and lock to those reference lines stretch to do. Okay, so it's kind of a higher end to it. But let's kind of think about some other things that we can go through and change too. You know, we can add parameters to this. Let me go through, oh, I should comment on the little equal relationship up here. All the equal is doing is based on the placement point, which is the center of, you'll find there's a reference line, uh, let me cancel this, reference plane here. It's actually called the center left right. There's some other ones in here which are like the front of the wall. I'm trying to find something in here, it's a good reference line. This is like the middle of the wall right there. But the line is placed, the window is placed based on that center left right. And the equality constraint is really just keeping it so that it's balanced on both sides. So when we say place a window and we give it a point, it places at that point and the width is just adjusted on either side as necessary. Okay, let's go and take a look at this from the, the front or the back side in the elevation view. You'll see there's all sorts of different parameters in here for the height, default sill height. As we're going through and working on these things, anything that we choose to go through and name becomes a parameter. Things that aren't named aren't parameters, but we could make them parameters. So let's see if we can sort of find something that is like that and actually add a parameter for it. So for example, oh, what do we have in here? I'm trying to figure out what's actually hanging on this three quarters of an inch. It looks like the, what I'll call sash width, this little thing around the outside. Hey, come on in, you can work in here. I'm just looking for a stapler. Ah, sadly, that we don't have. That's okay, thank you. No worries. Okay. If we take a look at this, it's hard to find staplers, no one has paper. You have to go to the copy room. Okay, this thing over here, which is an extrusion, which is really like the frame of the window, I guess not the sash. The sash would be kind of the part that's wrapping right around the glass. It's an extrusion that's wrapping around. It's determined by there's these green lines, top and bottom, left and right. And if we wanted to go through and have that frame depth be adjustable, currently it's set to three quarters of an inch. Okay. But if you wanted to go through and make that a parameter, what you could do is say, let's go ahead and add a parameter to it. Let's call it the frame thickness. Where did you click add parameter? Say again? Where did you click add parameter? Okay, what you do is you choose the dimension, and then up here at the top, you can choose a label for it. And you can either choose one of the existing ones, or you can add a parameter. And if you say add a parameter, and it gives you that dialog which lets you give it a new name. This is where you get to decide. There's a lot of cool things in here. You give it a name, it knows that it's going to be a length because it's a dimension, so it's kind of set up that way. So I'll say, great, that's the frame thickness. You now get this option of, is it a type parameter or an instance parameter? Type parameters are the same for all of the different elements, or will have the same value for all the elements of the same type. Okay. Instance parameters can change individuals. So it's really, you know, many of things like, oh, the height and width of the windows, since we have types which specify the height and width of the window, they all are type parameters. If you say a 24 by 36 window, they're all 24 inches wide, but we could make something an instance parameter. In fact, we do that an awful lot. These windows for right now, you know, hey, they're, they're kind of falling into, like, groups based on types, but if we want to start really adjusting the size of windows very, very precisely, we can make it instance parameters. So every window can have its own precise dimensions, as opposed to only being in a few categories. So I can say frame thickness in there. If I do say frame thickness, you'll see what's happening over here. Now frame thickness shows up as one of the parameters. So I can say, okay, let me make that 0, 1.5, try a bigger value in there, and when I apply that, ah, looks like it's not quite doing what I want in terms of adjusting that way, but I'll go ahead and make it that way. You notice the green line moved down, the reference line moved down, but it looks like the little extrusion here isn't actually tied to that. I'll go ahead and tie it to that, though. And how I would do that is... I come over, 
grab this extrusion. And what I want to do is just change this pink line, okay, so that it's locked to that green line. And how I do that typically is I'll align things. And I'll choose that one and this and say lock them together. Locking should have the effect of whenever that outer dimension changes, which moves the reference line, it'll then kind of change the shape of the geometry. Let's just try that again to see. If I said that I wanted to go through and make that, oh, two inches. Good. It did go ahead and adjust it. Can you uh, show how to get into the, uh, get to the pink line again? Sure. Okay. <laughs> what we're going to do there is choose one of the elements. For example, that's the frame element. This is the sash element. Let me even kind of change this one. I'll choose that extrusion, and I say Edit Extrusion. Now, since I adjusted that frame, it would probably make sense to also go through and adjust the sash, because they're sort of moving independently of each other. What I might want to do is take that upper part of the sash and kind of put it at the bottom of the frame and have a fixed distance, kind of pull it on down here. So what I could do is, in the same sense, I'll align AL, align, grab that, and say the top of the sash is going to be here. Oops. Let's see if I can move that. If it locked, it looks like it's locked to something. I'll leave it for there for right now. But when you're working with these things, it's a little bit tricky. You have to, especially with things or rabbit families are made up of a lot of different parts, you have to be careful about how the whole thing hangs together. Because the window, it turns out, is made up of several different parts. It's made up of, let's go on out there. You'll see there's this part, which is the frame. You have this part, which is on the inside which is the sash, and then even inside there, you have this piece inside here, which is the glass. So there's actually three different parts. But in the same sense, I could choose any of them and say edit the extrusion and get back to the pink lines. It's just that in the 3D view, you can't really assign the dimensions. You have to go to one of the 2D view to see if you can actually get to it. So you can go through on any sort of Revit family, go through and give yourself some new parameters or start changing the parameters and what they reflect. So you can start changing around what's available, and that kind of works out okay. The thing that we did the other day in terms of adding a shelf to this window involved actually adding another component, adding another piece to the whole thing. And to do that, there's a number of different ways you can do that. Yeah, we could go ahead and just kind of come up with another extrusion. That shelf is essentially like an extrusion that's just sort of pulled out from the surface. What I actually did, it gives me a little more flexibility, is actually modeled a separate little piece, which is the shelf, a little rectangular piece all to itself, and then inserted it. And the reason I like to do that is, you know, if it's kind of a you know, hierarchy of subcomponents and components, you get a little more flexibility or a little more stability by actually kind of building it up in separate pieces that are sort of manipulated independently. But let me show you what I mean. Back out here. So I got my little window here. He's kind of hanging out just fine. If I want to go through and add another piece, what I can do is as follows. I'll go through and open. I have this little shelf element. The shelf element's incredibly boring. Let's kind of take a look at it. It's just a big old rectangular solid. And if I look at it from the top, You'll see it has a width, it has a depth, it's sort of centered. If I look at it from the front, you'll see it has a thickness. So it's just pretty much a little rectangular solid. Okay. What this does have, though, going for it is it has three different parameters. It has shelf width, shelf thickness, and shelf depth. And we can manipulate those things. Okay. So what we can do is actually, this is our very powerful technique, make 
hierarchies where you put parts inside of parts inside of parts so that, oh, if I wanted to put a stack of five or six different shells, I wouldn't want to have to model them all independently. I can model one and then array them or something like that. And they would all pick up the same sort of properties. So if we were, for example, modeling furniture and you were modeling that chair you were sitting on, as opposed to modeling the five wheels independently, you'd probably model the wheel once, okay, and then just insert it and array it around five times. That way, if you improve it, it improves for all five at once, as opposed to having to do it separately. So, yeah, there's kind of a nice hierarchy to doing that. So, we'll come back out here. What I'll do is I'll open the one where it's adjusted. Actually, I should show you how I put it in there. Let's go back to just the, I got my shelf. And where did it go? I have my fixed window. So what you want to do is, if you want to pull in something to this to add to it, I'll just go to it from the top. Okay. I'm going to say, let's go ahead and insert. I'm going to load in and actually go load in that shelf. So parametric window, there's my shelf. See if I can see it. It's loaded. Might have to place it. Let's go ahead and say create. I'm gonna put a component in here. My adjustable shelf. <coughs> there's my shelf. Which mode is that? See again? I got a shelf hanging around in here. I'm just going to drop it right there. You're going to see it's not in the right place. Let me come out here and see it a little bit better. Can you show one more time how you got the shelf? Sure. Okay. What I'm going to do is, I'll take it out there again. I'll start by loading the shelf in. Oops. Hang on. I'll say insert and I'll load, and I'll go out there and grab the shelf. Let's get that shelf. Okay, loading it didn't actually place it in there, so after I load it, I'm gonna say, uh, I'm gonna create component, and I'm gonna place it in there. That's actually not too awfully bad, but we need to sort of put that shelf in the right place. It's there, it's just not hanging anywhere important. I'm sorry. I'm really sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I can't find this shelf. Oh, is it under, um, go under the session 4 point, session 4, it's under 4.1. Oh, it's 4.1, okay. There we go, go there. shelf adjustable size. Oh, okay. The, the fourth step is actually going to be already in there. Okay, so you have a shelf loaded in now, but oh, it's yeah. not placed. Now we'll create it, and we'll say uh, component, and uh, you'll put oh, it in there. Okay. okay, and you'll see it's sort of in the wrong spot. Yeah. We'll fix that. Okay, let's take a look at it from a couple of different perspectives. I'm gonna look at it from, oh, see if I put it on the exterior side or the interior side. There it is, let's see if it can hang around down on the floor here. Okay. That shelf is a nice little separate component. What I would like to do is sort of get it up and get it centered on the window. Okay, so to do that, what I'll do is I'll say align and I'll grab the top of the window, the little green reference line at the top of the window. Then I'll sort of choose the, see if I can get the center line of the shelf. You might have to tab a few times to get it. That's the top of the shelf, that'll work. I'll lock that to it. I'll do the top. You can do the middle. Okay, so now we got it up at the top. In theory now, what's going to happen is that window gets taller, that shelf is going to follow it because the shelf is always going to follow the top of the window. Okay, similarly, if that window gets uh, wider or smaller in terms of uh, kind of a horizontal dimension, we'd like that shelf to always be centered and always follow those dimensions. Okay, 
So how we do that is we'll take that shelf and I'm going to say let's take the center line of the window and then I have to find the center line of the shelf. I think it's, I hit it right there. Okay, now that shelf is going to be centered. Hmm. Looks like it's still sort of floating around in front, although it's centered in there. And that's just because from looking at it dead on, it's in the right spot. We have to kind of pull it back so it's actually up against the, the wall. So I'm going to look at it from either the left or the right side. Okay, for here, what I'll do is I have the shelf here and I want to back it up so it's up against the window. So I'm going to align, oh, I'll go from this front reference plane into the back. Okay, now it's up against there. Okay, let's go see. It, it has, it should have one in its center, but it also has one at the top. Okay, looks like, looks like you're centered now, so you're good there. Oh, so, so choose the top line there. And now, try, try choosing just the top. Oh, yeah, I think it's just on the opposite side of you. There you go. So I put the shelf on the inside of the house. Oh, don't worry, that's okay. Yeah, we'll, we'll adapt some of that, that's good. Okay. The final thing we want to do, though, is this. Let's go ahead and try this. You got a lovely looking shelf in there, and it's kind of fine. Let's go changing to a different size of window. How do you edit the, do you just have to unlock it then? Say again? To edit that relationship, you can just unlock it? Yes, and then kind of relock it somewhere else. Now you'll notice when I change my window size, I'm doing pretty good. It sort of stayed attached to the top. It looks like it's on the wall. That's fine. But right now, I don't yet have a relationship between the window width and the shelf width. And I'd like to go ahead and create some sort of relationship between those. Okay. So no worries. That's the next thing we're going to do. We're actually going to use parameters to relate those two things together, because we can construct all these little formulas that relate things. So try, if you've got your shelf in there, Try changing to a different size window and see if the shelf is centered in the right spot or if it needs to kind of be relocked a little bit. Okay, so try just under the, the type selector, go up to right here, okay, and try changing to a different size window. You can say apply. Okay, and it looks like it's still on the top. It's still sort of centered, but it's just still kind of an arbitrary distance out there. So what we need to do is we're going to create a relationship between the width of the shelf and the width of the window. And that's pretty easy. Let's talk about it. If you grab that shelf, let's actually go to 3D if you want to, and select that shelf, you'll see it has some parameters to it. It has shelf width, shelf thickness, and shelf depth. That's because that's what I put into the sub component. So, if I would like to go through and create a relationship between this shelf width and the width of the window, what I need to do is sort of put together some sort of either formula or just a direct relationship between the two. And how you can do that is if you come up here and you say shelf width and click on this little box right there, you'll actually get a list of parameters that are available to the define for the parent family. Okay, so if I want the shelf width to match the window width, I can choose width, and then the little two will always be hooked up. No matter what I do, the window size, the shelf width will adjust. Should be there. Very good. So now if I go through and change the window to a different size, with any luck, the shelf will stay attached to it. Excellent. So you can just say that any parameter is related to the parameter of another part. What you got, Ms. Dom? Having a little problem. No worries. Yeah, it looks like your width's okay. Yeah, the width changed, but shouldn't it like move? 
Well, we just need to go back to, let's go to that interior elevation. We must not have it quite locked. Okay, so let's try again. We'll do the alignment and grab the top uh, green line there, there, and get the top of the shelf and try locking that again. Okay, and now try. Okay, now try, now try changing the size. Excellent. Okay, that's a, that's a good looking shelf. <coughs> Now, we've set up a really simple relationship between the shelf width and the width of the window. We want to get a little more kind of elaborate than that, we certainly can. For example, just saying that it's equal is not necessarily the most interesting thing. If you said you wanted to, for example, have the shelf hang out a few inches on either side, or something like that, not to worry. Here's what we got to do. The trick is to think about where this has to happen. Because you sort of think that you want it to happen down in the shelf definition, but it's actually not there. What you have to do is define a distance or define a parameter in the window definition, which includes the extra infringement instance, and then associate it with the shelf. Okay, so let me test you what I mean by that. We'll go to just the family types dialog, okay, for the window, not the shelf. We'll say, hey, I got all these fantastic looking parameters. That's all looking fine. But I need a new one. I got this rough width. That was kind of okay. Or width. Where did width go? It's hanging around here somewhere. There it is. Width. Too deep. Okay. I need another parameter. I need something that is, oh, like shelf width or width plus margin or something like that. I need a little bit something else to it. So let's think about how we can do that. We could go ahead and just define that as a single formula, width plus four inches, width plus six inches. Or I could set up a couple different parameters. I could set up a parameter which is shelf overhang, and then say width plus shelf overhang. That way I would have the ability to kind of change the overhang too. So let me do it that way. Maybe that's the easiest way. I'll say, let's add a parameter. I'm going to call it the shelf overhang. Okay, that's going to be some little length, and we'll specify zero inches, one inch, two inch. We can put negative one inch in there, something like that, if we wanted to inset it as opposed to overhang it. So I'm just going to say, I'm going to add a new parameter and call it shelf overhang. Okay, where is it hanging around? There it is. It's currently sitting at zero. And I'm going to add yet another parameter. I'm going to call this the uh, shelf width with overhang. Now I have overhang and I have shelf width with overhang. And of course, that's uh, not really doing anything for us just yet. Let me kind of expand this out just so you can see it a little bit better. Okay. What I need to do is actually just put together a formula now that's going to relate those two things together. So my shelf width with overhang is going to be just the width of the window. So we're going to go width, and then I'm going to sort of add shelf overhang to it. So I'll just say width plus shelf overhang. Now you'll notice that now that I put a formula in there, that number is grayed out because I can't really change it. It's determined by something else. And if you want to test it, you can go ahead and put a number in there for the overhang, let's say like three inches or two inches or whatever you like in there. Okay, and you'll see that, ah, okay, it's now two foot three. Okay, that looks pretty good. So you're saying, okay, I got a number, no matter what happens to this, if I have a shelf overhang, it should go ahead and compute the overhang value. So say okay to that. I'll tell you what's going on. It's, it's, oh, it's interesting because I made that. Let me modify this. That width I actually, well, can I? Is it an instance parameter right now? Let me do it this way. Let me modify this. It's um, kind of in a funny hierarchy hole. 
I'm going to say make that an instance parameter as opposed to the width parameter. Right now, in this part, which is not really well defined, it says that the, the width can be changed on a window by window basis. So I said, oh, because of what I did for these examples, I could stretch them really easily. Okay, so if basically if the width is an instance parameter, then shelf width with overhang would be an instance parameter. They would have to sort of, uh, you know, if one can change instance by instance, the other one can change instance by instance. So that's a little bit different than it's defined in most standard windows. I sort of gummed that up a little bit for the example. if I want to take into account that shelf width with overhang is go back and grab the shelf again. And remember over here, shelf width was related to one of the parameters. So what I'm just going to do is reassociate that. I'm going to click the little equal sign and change it to shelf width with overhang. Okay, and now it'll have that little overhang to it. So since it's related that way, if I change the overhang to something very big, you know, the shelf will change. But as we do this, let me kind of abstract it just a little, because it's really, you know, as we think about parametric design, what this is going to get into is really, you start thinking about what are the drivers that you want to be able to change all the time, and sort of what things just need to smartly follow. Yeah, so we could just go ahead and lock that in to sort of a single value if we wanted to, because we're going to try and adapt to some sort of sun condition, change the shelf overhang on a window by window basis. We treat that a little bit differently. We make it an instance variable, but always keep track of sort of what it is you're changing, what are you trying to drive, and then what just needs to smartly follow so the geometry hangs together. And in this case, because we're giving ourselves a parameter and we're making it available to ourselves, you know, we can use it as a driver. We don't have to use it as a driver, but it's one of the things available. So as you're hanging things together, just think about, you know, yeah, just what's driving, what's following. Okay. So for typical little windows, like as I go through and place something like this, I can go through and adjust its location. That's just fine, you know, parametrically I can change that. I can also go through and change any of the parameter values in here. I can change shelf overhang. I can't change shelf width with overhang. That's going to fall out of the formula. I can change typically anything where it says default right here. Those are instance parameters. So those can be changed on a window by window basis. You'll notice shelf overhang though, that one foot two right there, that's actually not an instance parameter, that's a type parameter. So everything that has the same type, if I change it, would change for the entire type. So that might be useful. Maybe a better way to sort of talk about this would be to rename this. In truth, this is really more like, this is windows with one foot two overhangs. is a truer definition of what this is. Okay, because Exactly, they can be set independently. Yeah. So as a class, this is just windows of one foot two overhangs. Yeah. Yes. I changed everything and I have no 
And you have no what? No. Uh -huh. Let's see what you got. Okay, so let's go into the parameters there. So do you have, okay, you do have the overhang. And so the shelf overhang is zero. Give, give yourself a little number in there. Okay, so now it's going to be three feet. So it's going to be two, uh, okay, got it. Mm -hmm. Super. Say so, okay. Now let's come back over here to the shelf. And for the shelf width, right there where it's defined, uh, change it to shelf width with overhang, because that's going to be the writing variable. Thank you. No worries. Oh, this stuff is strangely. <laughs> I have it's, banana bread, by the way, if anyone wants to. It's picnic that. time. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, don't, don't feel bad. It, this is really, this is kind of intricately confusing about how this layering all works together. We could easily spend like you know, days and days talking about this. Okay, but we won't, because it's really, for the most part, well, later on. We may spend days and days talking about it when you, you need it more. But for right now, kind of just know that, you know, for every Revit family, you can sort of control its placement. That's what we typically do. And then once we place it, we can control parameters to kind of reshape it and resize it. And if you want to sort of customize this behavior, you can muck around with the parameters and make it a little bit better. Okay, we'll leave that alone. Because what I want to talk about next, and we'll do this for the break, is just talk about, oh, adaptive components, which are a little bit different. These type of components are good. You place them, you have one placement point. It is that intersection of the left, right, center. It's a placement point. Adaptive components have several placement points, okay, which give you a lot of flexibility, because they just don't have to exist in sort of x, y space and center themselves. They can stretch and deform and do whatever is necessary to go through and reshape. And the example was we looked at oh, putting some trusses in where the points that were defining the shape of the truss were varying a little bit as we moved along the building because they were kind of deforming to follow a curve, something like that. Very, very useful. One of the classic things we do with adaptive points now is um, any sort of a facade where Oh, there's curves and bulges and just sort of less regular forms. Okay. We panelize them. We break them up into kind of a series of components that can then be reshaped and resized and ultimately even digitally fabricated to kind of fit those precise shapes. So a lot of buildings you look at today, you know, aren't kind of a whole series of thousands of completely the same parts. There's these slightly adapted parts where the basic geometry is the same, but it kind of a, just reshapes itself a little bit as necessary. Okay, and that's what this whole next section is about. So for adaptive component families, let's start with, we'll just look at a couple, then we'll create some. Okay, so let's start with just looking at some. If you go ahead and open, and you go out and open under 4.2, So uh, let's look at sort of a real simple one. Let's say 3.ac. Three point AC is not all that interesting. What is this update thing? Oh, what's happening there is um, a lot of these things were saved in Revit 2014. Just every time we go to a new version, it updates. If I save them, which I should do, you know, in fact, let me do it now. Yeah, it'll, it'll stop asking us that. <laughs> okay, let's take a look at this thing. This little thing is really just like three or two line segments that are joining three different points. Each of those different things you're seeing there that look like oh, stars that say one, two, three, those are adaptive points. And what happens is those points, one, two, three, are placed by putting in X, Y, Z points, one, two, and three, and it'll sort of reshape itself. And what this geometry is saying is wherever those three points end up, draw a line segment from one to two and draw a line segment from two to three. Okay. And the nice thing is, wherever these things happen to end up, for example, if it ends up over there, that's just super. If it ends up that it's up high a little bit, see if I can get that right. I'm trying to get the blue guy. 
I don't want to get the number. I'm trying to get the arrowhead. And it's going to fight me. I'll just drag the red thing. Okay. No matter how that's reshaped, that'll always go through and connect those like three line segments, no matter what I do in there. Okay, and that's really useful. Now, this little guy right here with just sort of uh, the two line segments, not so interesting. That's kind of boring. But let's go ahead and take a look at something a little more interesting. Go to oh, the three point AC. How about go to the square truss? This is just an ever so slight variation on that last one. Take a look at it again. I'll look at it in 3D. You'll see it's still three points, although in this case the points are joined a little bit differently. The points are joined by, you can see there's actually kind of a squarish section that joins two and three and one and two. There seem to be some other segments that go across one to three, and even from the midpoints right here, there seem to be some things making like a little truss element. And again, the good thing about this adaptive truss is if that point happens to end up in a different place, it'll stretch. If that point happens to end up over here, it'll stretch. Okay. And that's really, really useful, is to be able to go through and have things that will just deform themselves to kind of wherever they need to be. That would save you an awful lot of kind of custom calculation and placement. How would you, so when I click on that, the planes and the arrows show yes. up really small way in the press, so I can't really get at them. How does, why is your summit bigger? Oh, chart rolling in or rolling out, just zoom in or out. Or it could be the whole scale thing. What do we got? They still hold this? Uh, this is like I can't really. Yeah. Figure out how to get in Now I'm with you. I have uh, trouble sort of with the sizing on those things too. Let's try this. Let me see if it makes any sense in terms of the scale of how that's presented. That's definitely one of the weird things about this. Okay. No, that's not really going to change it very much. Something about the relative size. I don't know, we have to look at. Say again? If you zoom out a bit, yeah. then the numbers will be smaller, but the arrows will stay the same, so it is slightly yeah. easier. Ah. It's counterintuitive. It gets bigger as you zoom out. <laughs> okay, that's actually a good suggestion. Thanks. But definitely kind of mucky that way. Okay, let's look at one more, which is. The same sort of notion of a three-point truss. Let's go for a three-point AC wire truss. And I'll save that, just so that's updated. I look at that in 3D. you'll see what's happening here is the truss is a little bit different. The truss is actually set up as now it's kind of a tube that stretches across between those three different points. Then we have a line that goes across, a midpoint, and then some like a secondary lines that kind of come up there. Okay. And if you want to, uh, you can go ahead. Let me go to view. Right up there. If I grab that, I'm going to say turn on X-ray. X-ray will just show you a little bit about how these things are actually defined. X-ray was I just turned on, I clicked on the tube and said, show me a little about how you define. And you see there's like a line that goes through and then a circle on either side, and it's basically extruded along there. Then there's actually some intermediate placement points in there. This line, this point down here, is probably just the midpoint of the line between the left and the right. These points over here in the middle of the tube, though, I imagine those are like somehow at the one-third point and the two-third point of the curve, or something like that. 
That's what my guess would be. But we can take a look and see if you can actually select the point. You can start to see that, ah, where this point is, it's considered to be at 0.66 along the curve. So super, that other one's probably going to be at 0.33. And the nice thing about sort of defining things in this kind of weird hierarchical way is that in that same sense, if I pull that out, the mathematics still holds together. Okay, so one of the trickiest part of what we're going to do next is really is to define these adaptive parts because they're kind of tricky to get just right. If you get them right, it makes your life infinitely easier. If they're not quite right, it's kind of hard because then you get these weird, undesired behaviors. But we're going to start by just defining something really, really simple okay, and go from there. Okay, so let's go ahead and we're going to create our own little adaptive part. It's going to be a very simple one. It's just going to be a tube, a tube that really just connects two different points. Okay, but hey, it'll be fine. Then we can later do a three-point tube. But for right now, two points is fine. Okay, to do that, okay, let's talk about what you got to do. We're going to create a new family. Okay, it's going to be called, oh, it's a generic adaptive family. Okay, that gives us the ability to have these different points, but let's see how it sort of works. If you say under the Revit menu, new, and you choose family, which is something we don't often do, you have all these different templates of different types of things you can create. And one of them is generic model adaptive probably the first one in the G's. But if you open that, you'll see you get sort of a big blank, oh, it's really just uh, like a grid system. Okay, so let's talk about what you can do here. Okay, so we basically have a big blank grid system. We're just gonna sort of put some points and lines on there and use that kind of define our thing. Okay. If we want to go through and have, for example, a two-point tube, what I'll do is go ahead and grab the line. Okay. Typically, that line that we define is considered to be a reference line. It can be a model line. Oh, model lines have meaning. Reference lines are strictly just kind of constructive geometry. Okay. You can sort of, it's, it's very sloppy about like uh, which one you can use, but generally we define the lines that are sort of the, or the paths as reference lines. And what I'm going to do is just go through and draw a line from here, just over there. There's nothing all that special about it. I can choose that line. Let me see if I actually did the right thing in terms of, I want to get the point at the end of it. Maybe I can do it in the other. Actually, I'm going to switch that out. I'm going to instead draw some points first and then connect the line between them. I'm going to put a line over here, a point over here. I'm going to put a point over there. And the reason I want to do that is I actually want to take that point and say, make it adaptive. That's the difference between a reference point won't be placed, you know, it, it won't adapt. It'll just sort of, sort of adapt, its, it'll, it'll adjust itself somewhere like relative to other things you place. The adaptive points, those are the ones where they're grabbing geometry when you place. Okay, so I'm going to make that one adaptive. I'm going to make that one adaptive. And then I'm going to draw a reference line between them. So I go from here to there. Now your first big test to see if this is working right is try moving one of the adaptive points and see if the line moves with it. Okay, let's see if the line deforms. So try grabbing that. Oh, 
it should. In fact, yeah, the fact that it didn't actually means that I got something wrong. Let's try it again. I'm going to do reference, do the line. How about this? I'm going to say 3D snapping. 3D snapping is going to pretty much guarantee that it grabs onto it. Where did you choose that? Um, it's up here. Oh, there you go. Let's so try. Yeah, I think it was exactly. It was sort of uh, placed in XYZ space, but it wasn't actually uh, hooking onto that. By going through and saying 3D snapping, I think we're going to go through and basically have it grab onto that. I'm trying to move in that now. OK, that's a little bit better looking. What I want to see is that thing just moving relative to it. Okay, so see if you can get that line to move or that uh, line to deform itself as you go through and like that and drag those points around. Okay, the reference line is really the path. That's the path we're going to sort of create some form that's going to follow that. What we're going to do on top of that path, we're going to draw a shape and just extrude it along or sweep it along that. Okay, and to do that, we're going to do something like this. Let me just go ahead and zoom on in here a little bit. In fact, I'm even going to orbit it a little bit so I can sort of look at it a little more dead on. You'll see that actually at the end of the line, there are several different planes indicators there. Okay. There are planes indicating kind of a horizontal plane, there's a plane indicating a vertical plane, you know, intersecting in all these different directions kind of around that point. Most of those planes are resolving to sort of the XYZ grid. There's one plane that's kind of at a diagonal. That's actually relative to being perpendicular to the line. That's the one we're going to grab. Yeah, what's your question? Um, when we place these planes before we made a dotted, does mm -hmm. it not get a reference on the other plane? No. Oh, okay. They are just, in fact, I think they're almost always reference points. We'll see. Okay. If we have that, here's the trick. We are going to try to grab of all those different planes, not the sort of horizontal, not the X, Y, or Z plane. We're going to try and grab the plane that is perpendicular to the line because we would like to draw a profile on that. The reason we'd like to draw a profile on that is then, no matter how the line gets deformed, the shape will always be perpendicular to the line. It'll sort of follow that. So. Let's just show you what I mean. I'm going to say, I'm going to grab a circle. So I'm going to draw a little round thing. It's going to say, what placement plane, plane would you like to put it on? I'm going to say, I would like to pick a placement plane. And then I'm going to come on down over here. And what I'm going to do is do a little tabbing until I sort of get the right plane. Not that plane. Not that one. Oops. Not the horizontal plane, not that plane. Oh, that was that plane, actually. But I want the one is the one that looks like it's oh, perpendicular to the line, that one. And when I have that plane and then I draw a circle based on that center, it's going to go through and draw that circle perpendicular to the line. The good thing is it will always be perpendicular to that line. Here. Super. So go ahead and see if you can go grab that one. And we'll pause there for a second. Let's see if you can get a circle that's just perpendicular to the line. Now, once you have a little circle, let's go ahead and do uh, give it a little uh, parameterization so we can sort of work with us. You'll notice if I click on the circle, I have a dimension right now, it says about 1 foot 10, something like that. 
This is a temporary dimension. Temporary dimensions are okay, but they go away. This is like click away. If I would like it to be a parameter so I can control the thickness of that tube, what I can do is make it a permanent dimension. And I can do that the easiest way is by just clicking this little glyph right here, which makes a permanent dimension out of it. Then once I have a permanent dimension, I can go through and add a label to that dimension, which then makes it a parameter. So I'll say add a label to this thing and call it, oh, this is going to be my tube diameter. Now, again, this is a case, do I want all of them to have the same diameter or do I want every individual one to be adjustable? I'm going to make an instance parameter so I have a little uh, flexibility. If you want to, you can do a little checking. It's a good thing to check. Just always, oh, if I have a parameter that says tube diameter, I think it's going to work there, but I'm not quite certain. Let's just go ahead and do a little verification. I'll try making it uh, like three feet. Looks like it did okay. Make it one foot. Seems like it did okay. Now. By putting this parameter in here, independent of how long that tube is, whatever shape that tube ultimately conforms to, it's going to have that parameter that lets us sort of change the, uh, the thickness of the bar. I didn't add the parameter incorrectly. Okay. So I think that that is uh, family tree. Uh, it, let's see where you are. Let's see, you have a, okay, got it. You are ready to take this geometry, this kind of abstract geometry, and actually make it into a real piece of form now. And how you do that is, oh, in the language of Revit, what you do is when you want to create an extrusion or a sweep in this case, what I'm going to do is choose a path and then choose a profile and create a form out of those two things. Yes? Let's take a look. It's consistent. <laughs> I'm, kidding. I'm always fascinated by, you know, oh, yeah. <laughs> when we consistently do it, because that yeah. means conceptually there's a hard thing in there, or that, you know, several of you did it exactly the same way. <laughs> a little off, but it was, you know, still, no, it's, it's always very interesting. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab the reference line. I can do this in either order. I'm going to grab the profile. For the profile, I might have to tab a little bit to see if I can get to it. Oops, there it was. There it is. Control click to get that. But I want to basically get the profile and the line. Then I'm going to say create a form. And what you'll get is this fantastic looking tube. Hey. Now, you have a fantastic looking tube over here. You can try adjusting your parameters. Let's go ahead and make it one foot, make it a tiny tube. Kind of an interesting thing there. Hmm, intriguing. Notice when I did it, and it may be different for you, it shrunk on one side, but it didn't shrink on both sides. Did it shrink on both sides for you or only one? Only one? Ah, hmm, how do you? Because we only choose one from the Yeah. Okay, yeah. let's go ahead then and fix that. We'll come back in here. If I choose this, let's see if I can x-ray it. Come back over here, see if we can make this work too. If I choose this one over here and give it a fixed dimension, 
Then also change it to be tube diameter. Okay, now it looks like we're good. Try it again. We'll change the parameter. Two feet. Not too bad. Now, interesting, you might note that it, it could be kind of cool to have things that are kind of thicker on one end and taper on the other end, and that could be something we actually want. So we might want to save two different parametric or adaptive parts, one that has a fixed width, one that has a tapering width. You could do all sorts of stuff like that. But once you have this part and you are happy with it, go ahead and just do a save and give it a nice name. Uh, I'm just going to put it out on my desktop. Okay, we'll do that. Okay, we'll put it out there. I'll put it out. And I'm going to call this, oh, what is it going to be? My tube. My adaptive tube, okay? I often go through and just put some sort of designation about how many points are used to place. In this case, it's going to be placed by two points. Because later on when you're using them, it's kind of helpful to know what I was expecting. Because if in order to use this, I'm going to have to feed it two points. If I have something that's curvaceous, I might need three points. This is going to be a 2.1. Okay, say OK. Super. And this is going to be ready to use. Now, there's some other ones that are sort of very similar, just so you get a sense of other ones that are out there. We're going to use them in just a minute. But if you want to go out and take a look uh, under session four, there's a lot of examples of different parametric or uh, component families. I've got adaptive beams, like a two point beam or a three point beam. A two point beam is sort of a good example. You'll see that one is actually set up right now so that there's a profile at both ends and the beam can taper. That's kind of a really useful thing to have sometimes for uh, a lot of things that we want to fabricate. If I go through and I look at the three-point beam though, You'll see it's kind of interesting. As soon as you give me a third point, all of a sudden now I have the ability to follow a curve. Okay. So as opposed to having straight lines, I could have little curve segments that go between the three different points. And again, that's going to be useful to us too. But let's pause and break right now and come on back in five if you can. And what we'll do is come on back and show you how you actually use these things now that you start to create them. And we'll keep on creating lots more of adaptive parts, but the general principle is put those adaptive points in there, kind of create lines and form connecting them, and then a lot of testing just to make sure if those points move, that things sort of stretch the way you want them to.